magic uh, 2.50 mark, which is when I believe we're starting. So if everybody's ready, ready, uh, let's, uh, let's get started. Um, you can hear me okay, right? Yeah. Excellent. So welcome uh, to those of us joining uh, remotely. Welcome to my esteemed panelists. Uh, we probably have the most intriguing of all sessions uh, with the title Quietly a Revolution May Be Fomenting. Uh, my name is Anna Tunkel, and I'll be chairing this panel with the strategic initiatives and global partnerships um, at APCO Worldwide. Um, APCO is a global advisory firm. We're operating in more than 60 markets at the intersection of strategy, business diplomacy, public affairs, and communications. Uh, and I'm joined on this panel um, by an esteemed group, uh, David Ferguson, Executive Managing Director of Generational Equity, Marietta Robinson, former Commissioner of the Consumer Product Safety Commission, uh, Matt Spence, former U.S. Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense, Elaine Dzinski, founder and managing partner of Lumirisk, and Ziad Alexander Hayek, Vice Chairman of the UN Working Party on Public-Private Partnerships um, from Lebanon. Uh, just one second, slight technical glitch in making sure that I'm uh, closing the audio sound on something else. Um, so over the past uh, 10 months, COVID virus has taken more lives than HIV, malaria, influenza, and cholera combined crossing the 1 million mark of deaths just this past weekend. It has also had implications on the most vulnerable uh, in our society. Two billion workers are earning their livelihoods in the informal economy. And according to the ILO estimates, 21% um, in the developed markets and more than 50% in emerging economies uh, will be losing their income over the course of this year. According to McKinsey and Lean In research that was published just yesterday, one in four women are now considering leaving the workforce, uh, which ultimately contributes to about two million women um, at the risk of losing or losing their, their jobs. Uh, at the opening of the virtual UN General Assembly last week, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres said that COVID wiped more than 25 years of progress towards the SDGs. The pandemic caught the most advanced nations, with the U.S. at the very center, unprepared, and with deep and long-lasting implications, heralding, heralding a recession uh, of the century and disrupting the labor market. And for, from a public health standpoint, it's probably unknown whether the world will be better or more or less prepared for, for the next pandemic. As I've mentioned, I'm joined by an exceptional group of experts and, and panelists uh, with long and distinguished public sector careers and leadership uh, in business. We would like to keep this discussion as dynamic and, and interesting as possible uh, in the 40 minutes that we have together. And so I would like to turn each of, to each of you uh, for a quick introduction of, um, of your background and what you do at the moment um, and your perspective on what do you see as the most acute and long lasting challenge uh, of the pandemic. And since we have such a global group represented, um, I, I welcome you to, to share that perspective either from, from a country that, that, where, where you are at the moment, a regional perspective or global. So let's start um, with Matt. I'm just calling on, on folks in the order of their appearance on my screen. But if you want to go next, you can also raise your hands in terms of preference. But I'm, I'm going to call on each of you. Great. And, and yeah. I'll make a quick housekeeping, let's make sure that we mute our mics when we're not speaking just for um, uh, audio. Great, Anna, Anna, thanks so much. I mean, after, uh, as you mentioned, I spent seven years serving in the government and the national security side as Deputy Secretary of Defense and Special Assistant to the President for International Economics. And now I'm a professor of practice at Thunderbird at Arizona State and also have spent time working in finance and venture capital. I think one thing that I think about as we look at what the stakes are here is in the United States, this is as important a historical moment as I think after World War II, after the Great Depression, and as any major change that we can face and a large part of making a decision for our country. When I was in the government, I was always struck by the enormous power we had at the Defense Department, but the enormous things that we were unable to do despite the greatest challenges we had. And here are the two things that I think are both the greatest concerns I have from the COVID piece, but also enormous opportunities, are both the economic impact and the education impact. And it's the economic inequality and the disparate impact of COVID, which has been tremendous. And just a few statistics to highlight, Anna, what you said. Now, only 20% of workers in the United States with a high school diploma or less 
could work from home. 63% of workers with college degrees were able to. Right now, home values are at the highest levels. Of course, that benefits people who own homes and have the wealth to buy homes. Unemployment was 20% lower or worse for workers earning $14 an hour or less, and it was down 16% for workers for 14 to 20 hours or less. It's been an enormous disparate impact on black and women. Uh, black men and women have only recovered 20% of the jobs lost from COVID, whereas 40 to 45% of jobs for white men and women have respectively been recovered. So what all these numbers mean is this is a time where COVID has caught our attention for what's happening right now, but it really has exasperated longer-term inequality and longer-term structural problems with our own government. It's no surprise that there's tremendous concern and anger at our governments. But the way I think about it is that one of my colleagues at the Defense Department used to say is when we were working with wars in Afghanistan and Iraq and conflict in Syria, what we need to look for in, an in a situation like this is not just the crisis, but the opportunity. And what I think we have now is the opportunity to think about how to have a different set of workforce who are not disproportionately impacted by these crises. And also, how do we think about education to use this as an opportunity of the online power we have to allow people to have better skills to address these crises, which are going to happen in the future even more. Thank you, Matt. Um, let me go to Marietta, who uh, had a distinguished career in, in the government, and we would, would love to hear your perspective. Thank you, Anna. I was a lawyer for many, many years, but the experience that I had that's most relevant to the discussion today was um, I was appointed by President Obama in 2013 as Commissioner of the Consumer Product Safety Commission, where I served until 2018. Um, many people are discussing the massive changes that may take place in our institutions if the Democrats get both the presidency and control of the Senate. But I think the biggest revolution, in my view, that's fomenting in the U.S. is an increasingly loud cry across the political spectrum for simply making our government institutions that already exist do their jobs. COVID-19 has focused Americans for the first time in decades on just how weak our federal government has become and how essential it is. The private sector, no matter how good its intentions might be, simply does not have the answers that we need right now. There was a time when our government institutions in the United States were the envy of an example for the world. That is no longer the case. While most of us were not paying attention, our government has been slowly weakened by the drip, drip, drip of anti-regulatory, anti-tax, anti-government fervor of the few who profit from when there are no rules and who have spent billions of dollars in campaign donations to elect those of both parties who would embrace the narrative that government needs to get out of the way and let corporations make money however they will. The parts of our government that were created decades ago to correct, to create, to protect the rest of us were patiently and steadily destroyed. But it's important to remember that this erosion that took place slowly over several decades with this administration, they came in and they made the promise to engage in a daily fight to completely destroy the administrative state. And they have really delivered. Before the pandemic, many were alarmed that when they discovered that the Federal Aviation Agency had basically been taken over by Boeing, who essentially unregulated, took safety cuts in the interests of profits that resulted in hundreds of deaths. Then the pandemic arrived, and we discovered that the rot that existed at the FAA permeated all of our agencies. Oregon Governor Kate Brown spoke earlier today, and she said there has been no federal response to the pandemic, and I could not agree more. We keep asking where our government is right now, whatever our party. We have no regulations or oversight. We have tens of thousands of people dying in nursing homes owned by private equity firms focused on shareholder profits over even the most basic patient safety measures. We have no good regulations that protect our workers in our poultry and our meat factories. We've had hundreds of millions of dollars that were intended for small businesses instead be handed to banks that gave them to the richest individuals and corporations. No one in this country's 
coordinating how we address foreclosures or evictions in the long term or overseeing debt collectors. No one is coordinating the purchase and distribution of protective gear. We have no credible government source for factual science-based information on this virus or the vaccine, and no one is overseeing the quality and reliability of tests all things that our government agencies should be doing. But the tide's really changing, and that's where I see a revolution. For the first time in decades, we are seeing op-eds by business leaders saying regulation is good for business. When we see even pharmaceutical companies asking for regulation, you know that a revolution's afoot. The title of this is about the quietly fomenting, and I don't know how quietly this revolution is fomenting, but I really think it is. Thank you for that optimistic uh, view, um, and let's let's be hopeful. Um, David, let me turn uh, to you. Uh, try again. You're still mute. Yes, thank thank you very much. And um, uh, firstly, I'd like to thank Frank for uh, for challenging the odds and and persevering to to uh, to bring um, thoughtful women and men from across the globe together for this forum. Uh, if anybody could do it, I, I knew he could. Um, Marietta, thank thank you for uh, inadvertently set, setting me up for uh, for my remarks. Um, uh, by day, I'm uh, executive managing director of M and A for Generational Equity. We're we're uh, North America's largest lower middle market investment advisory firm. Um, I was uh, lured to the World Economic Forum six years ago, where I became uh, an algorithmic um, technology junkie. My science prof teachers and professors would have been very proud and, and most skeptical that that could have ever happened. But it uh, it, it brought me to uh, to bring forward uh, uh, a book, The Transhuman Code, which became a bestseller last spring and now a forthcoming uh, series on CNBC. And I've, I've appreciated the opportunity to, to be in my bunker uh, over the last nine months, albeit traveling uh, occasionally, and really uh, think about what the, what the effect has been and, and what the outcome can be going forward. And um, I've, uh, I've committed um, to, uh, to write another book together with my co-author, Carlos Morera, founder of WiseKey, and uh, I think it's aptly titled Pandemocracy. We find ourselves living in a, a most uncertain season. We're certainly marked by unexpected fragility. We're chasing down an unruly pandemic. And in its wake, we're navigating the consequences of what I believe to be an infected global democracy. It, it's, not, it's not what uh, our founding fathers envisioned for the United States, I believe. And it's, it, it, it's certainly not uh, what the early Greeks envisioned when, when democracy was first established. Um, I'm sure many of you have, have seen the annual Democracy Perception Index from Dahlia Research. We probably didn't pay very much attention to it until this June. Um, but uh, how disappointing it is to see that um, of the 53 countries surveyed, only two felt that the U.S. has handled this pandemic successfully. And you might also not be surprised to know that one of those two was the U.S., so it, it appears, at least in this moment, that the resulting effect um, here in our country and in other Western civilizations is a trending away from decentralization and movement back towards a, a geopolitical pre-Cold War dynamic of, of us versus them. And like humans are wired to do, our survival instincts are in overdrive. We spend many waking hours thinking, worrying, strategizing about how to combat this threat that we can't simply shoe or spin away. And when we're not consumed with our current defense, we're wondering about life as we know it or perhaps as we once knew it. And I think we're all asking what's the best way forward. Um, and I think we're all wondering is, is this seismic shift the new normal and, and ultimately where will it lead us? So this, this pandemic really has, has trained a spotlight on the fault lines, both in national and global collaboration. And I think that's the, the word that, that rings loudest for me because we simply just don't work well together within our countries and, and between countries. Um, you know, maybe um, we act too self-interested politically, financially, nationally to see the, the reasons why we have to work together. But 
I, I believe that the opportunity lies in, in that we are experiencing this catastrophic global event and it has the opportunity to illustrate for us just why collaboration isn't just a grand idea that, that we still have work to do to apply collaboration as a necessity. And I do believe that, uh, that our technological competence, of course, has never been at a higher level, but it's fractured both nationally and, and most certainly internationally. But together, we really do have the tools for solutions. Um, I believe we just haven't figured out how to share them. I also don't believe that it's simple to do that. Um, these, these fractures within the national and the geopolitical landscape, um, however, they, they can still be the light at the end of this unprecedented tunnel, or sorry, tunnel, <laughs> if, if we so choose. Um, the latest lessons and the, you know, the brightest case studies tell us that if we know where to look and, and what to learn, then the pandemic has exposed these major weaknesses in, in our global democracy. You know, the, the status of the United States as a global leader over the past seven decades has been built not just on wealth and power, um, but I think equally importantly on the legitimacy that, that flows from our domestic governance, our provision of global public goods, and, uh, and our ability to to muster and coordinate a, a global response to crisis. But um, I think we'd all agree that this pandemic is, is really testing uh, these elements of leadership. The, the problem I believe that ensues that, you know, when a society leans down the path of, of growing uniformity, uh, which is the formula that was once given to us, um, we can very easily end up with a one size fits none situation. And that's, that's where I think we are now. So um, returning power to the electorate, I, I believe truly has to be uh, a focus of ours. There are some great stories uh, across the world. Um, you know, not surprising, uh, the oldest operating democracy today is, is Iceland, you may know. And of course, they're at, at the top of the league table when it comes to addressing uh, the pandemic. Uh, so, too, is Finland. Uh, so, too, are, is Switzerland. And these, com these countries, interestingly, have been very early adopters in, in utilizing technology to, to advance not only the the role of the electorate, but but also the outcome that they're able to affect. And so if if I look forward and, and I, I, I'm looking forward to discussing with you all today, you know, there really are, are three pillars um, that can help us build, you know, the, the most effective symbiotic world that we desire. And, and those are trust and collaboration and, uh, of course, the the ability to to um, rally behind an inclusive movement. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, really, really important perspectives. Uh, Elaine, let me turn over to you. And for those of you joining us uh, right now at, uh, through the stream, uh, we are talking about um, how the panelists view the most acute and long-lasting implications from, from the pandemic. Hey, thanks, Anna. Hi, everyone. Good to be here. Um, so let me just say, I think I, I can hardly find a way to disagree with everything that's been said so far. Um, and I've been able to check off a couple of the points that I would have liked to make. Um, but if you'll accommodate me, uh, I'd like to talk about two additional angles that I think are um, pretty critical as, as we consider whether uh, some sort of revolutionizing. Um, one is that I think the pandemic has really brought home the fragility of our economic security in this country. And I think it's probably best described by looking at our critical supply chains uh, and what happened in the early days of the pandemic, uh, the unavailability of, of PPE uh, and the real questions around how we were gonna source to meet basic needs. And this has really started a much broader conversation about um, what are the critical supply chains uh, for the U.S.? How does that tie into our um, evolving definition of economic security? And what does it mean in terms of, of our reliance, particularly on China? And I think it's difficult um, to have a conversation about the impact of the pandemic without talking about China and how this is really affecting uh, U.S.-China relations in a way that I don't think anybody would have expected. Uh, and building on the idea of critical supply chain uh, and really understanding where we have vulnerabilities, 
this has now spurned more conversation around uh, what it means to reshore to the U.S., whether that's possible. We have highly, highly complex supply chains across most of our industrial base. Um, we have a lot of reliance on uh, China in particular, and there's a growing concern about what that means for our economic security. And so I think we are likely to uh, see a lot more of the conversation around uh, near shoring or what I've written about recently, which is ally shoring, the idea that uh, we need to think about working more closely with democratically minded uh, governments around establishing a set of the rules of the game. Um, and that's not just around critical supply chains, but it's also about how we're engaging uh, in the world order and uh, what, what rules we're using to do that. Um, so that's the first area. And then the second area is really around uh, the impact on corporations. So we've heard a little bit about the impact on, on, on society, but I think the pandemic has really brought out uh, the um, employer-employee contract, if you will, right? Um, it's an element maybe of the social contract. And if we look at how Germany uh, and Denmark, for example, essentially froze the economy and froze the relationship between the employer and the employee. Uh, it was to preserve uh, employment in a way that actually we weren't really set up to do in this country. Um, so we've had a lot of bailout funds, um, you know, certainly some efforts uh, to shore up the economy that have probably helped. Uh, but I think this is causing a, re a rethink, if you will, about uh, the, the social contract. And what are the expectations of employers and corporations? And how does that link into uh, responsibilities of, of the government? And um, here, I think we're getting to a different dynamic. Uh, and you know, we're moving more from the discussion around the shareholder value to the stakeholder value. And this links into the uh, ESG agenda uh, and more broadly thinking about um, how corporations um, many of whom are now indebted to the U.S. government for bailout funds, um, what their obligations are and what the expectations are uh, of citizens. And this, I think, is something we need to watch very closely and where companies need to have a more proactive view on how they're thinking about this um, and what it means to protect uh, employees in this environment. So I realized I rushed right in without even saying uh, anything about my background, but for the last 20 years, I've uh, been um, more or less at the intersection of business and government, having worked at the U.S. Department of Homeland Security, where I was the acting and deputy uh, assistant secretary for policy uh, at the World Economic Forum, where I worked with Anna and many others on building out the anti-corruption program. Uh, and uh, spent some time at Interpol uh, working on law enforcement activities and now run my own consulting um, practice, which is really focused on, on risk management. Um, so putting that aside, <laughs> um, I think these two issues of economic security and thinking through uh, the dynamics around uh, what it means to be on the right side of issues as a good corporate citizen. The final point I'll make is uh, we spent a lot of money as a government dealing with pandemic. And at some point the bill is coming due. And the question we have to ask ourselves is who's going to pay for it? And here, I think we're going back to look, um, I, I, this would be my, 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 my future prediction that we're gonna be looking at a lot of the companies uh, that have trillions of dollars in value and have huge cash positions. Um, I think we're uh, we're going to see um, a pretty significant rise in the corporate tax rate uh, as payment for where we are now. So that will continue to change the dynamics um, around uh, that relationship between business and government. Uh, and then when we overlay that uh, additional piece of economic security and the criticality around supply chains, um, we have yet another um, interesting element. So where's the opportunity in all of this? I think um, we have the opportunity to redefine the rules of the game. And we need to think more clearly about um, how our alliances globally can be uh, mutually supportive. Um, so, you know, it goes way beyond an America first agenda. It's really about democracy first. Um, and we need to get to that space uh, and figure out how to leverage uh, democratically minded uh, initiatives and, and, and joint economic security. Thank you.
Thank you, Elaine. And I think the future of democracy is very much at stake. And we, I think all of us based in the U.S. at the moment are looking at this keenly. And I think we'll, we'll get to, to that question in addition to a few of the other great points that you raised. Um, Ziad, last but not least, um, you come from, from Lebanon but have worked globally and bring more of a global perspective to to the plight of the emerging markets um, in COVID. So so would love for, for your uh, take on the implications from other parts of the world. I think we've, we've discussed more U.S. and other global-centric perspectives. We'd love your uh, point of view. And you're on mute. Sorry. It's probably the most commonly repeated sentence in the past. <laughs> exactly. Uh, thank you very much, Anna. Um, I, um, well, my background is I'm an investment banker by background, uh, ended up spending the last 13 years working for uh, advising four uh, Lebanese prime ministers. And uh, I'm now uh, president of the World Association of public-private partnership units, and vice chair of the UN Working Party on PPP, and um, managing director of Hayek Associates, which is my own firm, um, the, uh, that does basically corporate finance. So um, the, um, I'm, I'm a, a, I confess I'm a globalist. Um, I have, you know, I think the world has to be one world. It's too small for us to think about it and, and create these fictitious borders between us. Um, but um, unfortunately, uh, this has been happening a lot. Um, globalization, for many good reasons, has driven various societies around the world already to uh, sort of look for their own local interest. And, um, and of course, there's been many populist presidents and prime ministers that uh, have come to power over the past decade or so, and they have almost everywhere in the world, and they have been feeding this more and more uh, populism, uh, closing borders. Um, and of course, we're seeing now with COVID-19 the implications of having a global crisis and trying to deal with it at national levels, even in some places at state level. So um, this, is, this is the main problem we have, I think, and um, governments have have approached the COVID-19 problem with basically two solutions in mind. One is deficit spending, and the other one is lockdowns. And deficit spending, uh, governments can only do so much of that. It, it, is, it has its limits. It's the private sector that finances the government through taxes in order for the government to exist. It cannot be the other way around. It cannot be that the government is financing the private sector. It will lead to major e economic dislocations in the long term. So this is not a this is not something that we can count on for the long term. And yet, um, the pandemic and its effects are going to stay with us for the long term. I think we're just basically we're barely starting with this thing. And to think that this is we're going to end with it, you know by the U.S. elections in November is, is just like absolutely incredible to most of the rest of us around the world anyway. Um, the, um, the other thing is the uh, lockdowns. Well, lockdowns are basically a balance that governments have had to adopt be, uh, between uh, what is the medical uh, imperative and what is uh, what what the economy can bear. Um, now, these have been managed largely in, I think, knee-jerk reactions in places. Um, you know, we're panic. There's um, a lot of cases. Let's shut down the economy. In some places, they will let restaurants open till 10, but not till 12. And other places, they will let them open till 6 p.m. And really, there's no... There's not much um, analysis that has gone behind sort of intelligently, the intelligent use of lockdowns, how they may apply to different generations, how they may apply to different parts, not, not even within a country. I, I would say within, within a district, um, you know, how, how these uh, lockdowns can be done. So the, um, I think that um, there are several things that governments need to do. First of all, they need to reestablish trust. 
And unfortunately, because of what has been happening before, the things I mentioned about globalization and about uh, populism, there is very little trust in government. Uh, we've been losing that over decades, almost everywhere in the world. And so now it's really very important for governments to be um, straightforward with information, transparent. Their use of technology, which is creating so much conspiracy theory, you know, am I being surveyed? You know, are, are gov- is my government using this COVID-19 as an excuse to, to survey me? Um, so governments need to reestablish the trust, I think. They need to raise public awareness. They need to make people understand that this is something that everybody has to do together, socially, medically, financially, economically. And interestingly, I think, you know, David mentioned Finland and Switzerland and, and, and Iceland. These are countries that have a lot of social cohesion. These are countries where, and they have a very high awareness. So this is, this is very important. And talking about social cohesion, I think also Elaine mentioned Germany and Denmark. I mean, the use of how we're all going to cooperate. Everybody is going to cut down on their working hours so that other people can maintain their jobs. I mean, these are cultural, you know, very, very important things that not every country can apply, but yet governments have to start educating their people on on needing to apply them. Um, Consulting all stakeholders. Every government that, you know, says, this is how I'm going to do it. And of course, you know, there is no right answer to dealing with COVID, um, no matter what you do. So every government that says, this is how I'm going to do it, is going to face opposition and is going to face problems. And they need to reach out to, to the political opposition within their country. They need to reach out to NGOs. They need to reach out to the medical profession, to labor unions. Uh, they need to understand and bring everybody on board. Um, resist overreaction to the left um, I, you know, it is happening in many countries around the world where, oh, we have COVID-19 problems. So, you know, we need solutions to sexual abuse. We need solutions to the environment. We need solutions to, uh, you know, all sorts of things. That's true. All of these things need to be resolved, but we should not make COVID-19 carry more burden than it already does. We need to deal with it, you know, separately, I think. Um um, the, um, yeah, let me just um, also let me open this up to to the discussion. I'm also mindful a little bit. So I didn't mean to cut you off, but I'm a little mindful of uh, of the of the time. What okay, I mean. I'll I'll rush very quickly. I want to say that um, uh, governments need to spend wisely. They need to uh, look at where they spend their money, like spending on on childcare, may be much more important. For example, at this point in time. Uh, when people, you know, are losing jobs, et cetera, than on other things. Uh, I'm not giving a particular solution. I'm just saying, you know, as as other panelists have said, we need to rethink what we're doing. Um, but there are there are two last points that I would really like to make. One is reaching out to civil society and involving NGOs. In many countries, especially in my country, in Lebanon, where we have had wars, as you know, for a long time, our government does not function. We have a non-functioning government. And if we had to rely on government, we would get nothing. So um, civil society in Lebanon, you know, is is what provides the safety net. And we've had the explosion in Beirut, almost, you know, quasi-nuclear explosion that you've heard of. And the people actually on the ground helping with reconstruction and doing all the work are just volunteers in civil society. And this goes back to ethics and goes back to social cohesion. And we need to, you know, make sure that that part, why why give money to corporations? Why not give money to NGOs um, that are, you know, finance NGOs that are doing some good work? Um, the, and the last thing I want to talk about is, is really um, that um, the... Um, the um, well, what I want to say is that the is the social dimension is the social dimension of human nature that is lacking. You know, if we're going to wait for governments and bureaucrats and bureaucracies to deal with something like this, we're going to fail. We need to appeal to the social dimension in human nature. Thank you. 
Thank you. And uh, and unfortunately, we have so such little time. So what I want to do is, if you have super quick reaction to, there are so many great points that were made, and I think so many points of synergy across uh, across your remarks. So if there is a quick intervention or reaction to one another, I'll, I'll allow this in the context of about a minute. And then I wanted to pose a question so you can, if you don't have an intervention, and think about this one. Um, we all talked about the importance of collaboration. Global institutions that govern global governance standards are the driver of, of, of this collaboration. And as we're watching WHO get defunded, weakening of the UN, and some of those institutions that serve as sort of agenda setters and, and drivers, uh, what is your view on future of governance beyond uh, COVID? So I'm going to pose this question, but if there are any quick um, feedback points, Maria, you, you yeah, just very quickly say, I think this is an amazing opportunity right now because it's the first time in a hundred years that people around the world basically have the ability to compare oranges with oranges. Yeah, exactly. Because we are dealing with a pandemic. And as Zayed correctly said, nobody's got magic answers or how to deal with COVID, but we see all of our government structures, whether it's got to do with domestic abuse, onto education, onto um, unemployment, workplaces, nursing homes. We have all of those institutions in these governments that can really be compared. And I think thinking people are really doing that. And I love it. I think it's a great opportunity. Mar Marietta, I, I would add to that. If, if we look back at the origin of democracy, um, it, it, it was conceived to, uh, to allow the elders of the communities, those that were the wise, unfortunately, uh, almost always men, um, travel to what was determined to be the seat of power and, and to represent the interests of their electorate and, and to bring the resources back to them. Well, today, we, we know that we have wise people in, in every corner, in, in, uh, in every country, in every vocation. And in fact, we have more wisdom, it could easily be argued, outside of the seats of government than within. So this is where technology, I think, uh, is, allows us the opportunity to bring the power of the people into the decision-making process. Not, not an easy charge by any means. But, but we have the ability to do that today. And I think this is where the spotlight has been placed on, on these cracks and, and fissures in our current system. Karen, I would say, I think, I think this is time we need a new Bretton Woods. We need a new Yalta. We need a new international creative forum to get together to exchange the ideas and talk about designing some new institutions. We've been living with Cold War institutions for quite some time. I think this should be a shot to tell us to wake up take a step back and really opportunity to really design something new. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think we have an opportunity, as I said, to kind of re rethink the rules of the game. Um, but the situation is very different than it was 70, 80 years ago. Uh, and, uh, you know, going back to the strategic competition with China, I think it's going to be a rocky road. Um, so we really need to think clearly about how we want to go forward and from a citizen perspective, I think citizens continue to find their voice uh, through social media, through other mechanisms, uh, and uh, that's important. And somehow we need to be able to protect the systems that allow uh, citizen voices to be heard. Not, not just heard, but acted upon, I think, as is, is, is well, Elaine. Absolutely. Uh, Zaid, any comments from you as we uh, wrap up? Unfortunately, yeah, I just want to be friends with all the panelists. I, 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 I love what everybody had said, has said. It's fantastic. <laughs> Look, I think a sign of a great conversation is that I feel like we could go on for at least two more hours. And I haven't even gotten to a full list of questions I was hoping to ask you. But um, what I may suggest is that we also, you know, maybe replicate this. Um, we at Apple also do global convenings and so many of the points that you made are essential, especially on the institutional reform. Um, and, uh, and I would love not only to continue this conversation, but also find avenues and ways for us to, to collaborate through different paths that you wear and organizations that you represent. So uh, with 15 seconds to spare, <laughs> I didn't want to cut off anybody mid-sentence, so I monopolized the last bit, but just wanted to say how much I enjoyed your, uh, your remarks and hope for us to continue forward. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Anna. Well Thank done. You. This Thank is delightful. Thank you to all of you. Thank you very much. My first conference.
<laughs> well, <laughs> the next one in person. Cheers to the next one, us reconvening in person. Thank you, everybody. Bye bye. Thank you. Uh, bye. I don't really know how to exit. <laughs> 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 it's like <in> California, right? <laughs> it's, well said. <laughs> Thanks, Anna. <laughs> Bye, Matt.